Hi, I'm Kyle Ingham, founder of The Distilled Man. And up next, we're going to talk about that thing that so many people dread, small talk. Ah, small talk, that dreaded small talk. Conversation skills are so important to our interactions with other people that it's amazing that it's not taught in most formal schools. Being able to make small talk and have conversation with someone can make a huge difference in terms of your first impression, whether it's trying to impress that future boss, whether it's uh, a lady friend who might be someone you're interested in, or whether it's just a good friend who you want to make a good impression on, being able to make small talk and carry on a conversation can go a long way. But small talk is awkward. I don't, I don't like it. I know that's what you're thinking right now. But the thing is, life would be a lot more awkward if we didn't have small talk. Can you imagine? Uh, excuse me, uh, my name is Bill. Very nice to meet you. I need you to tell me your position on abortion and tell me your deep-seated religious beliefs. Small talk is a necessary evil, but it doesn't have to be evil. I mean, ultimately, you just have to recognize that it's an entry point for a potentially deeper conversation. With small talk, the true goal is rapport. And rapport is that situation where you're talking to the other person and you, you both kind of forget that you're having a, a small talk, that suddenly things have transitioned past that. You've got a connection of some sort and the conversation just flows naturally. So the two things that you can do to help improve your chances of having successful small talk are, one, having more of a fundamental connection with that person, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And number two, trying to use small talk to find common ground. So how to connect with other people on a more fundamental level? The fact is people make snap judgments about you based on how you appear, your attitude, your presence, how you carry yourself, you know, how you dress, uh, but most of all, how you make them feel. And you want people to trust you and feel comfortable around you. So one of the things to do is to really look at your attitude and look at your body language and just make sure that you've got a positive attitude, first of all, and that you've got open body language. And what does that mean? It means you know squaring off to that person, facing them, and really making your body open to them as opposed to being closed off or you know having your arms folded or you know being distracted you know looking at your watch all the time or something like that if you go into that situation and you're maybe you're not really interested in talking to that person or if the entire time during the conversation you're just in your head thinking about oh I'm terrible at small talk I'm so I'm so socially inept you know pretty soon they're going to start picking up on that and that's not going to be a good experience for either of you. What's interesting, too, about making fundamental connections with people is that people are drawn to people who are like them. Have you ever noticed how when you go traveling, say, in Europe, and you meet somebody from the United States over in Belgium or wherever you are, immediately you have a connection, even if you've never met them. Suddenly, you know, the contrast of being around these people who speak a different language to you and then meeting this person who speaks your same language, has the same sort of cultural vantage point as you do, you have this immediate connection because they're like you. People like people who are like them. So Nicholas Boothman in his book, uh, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds, talks about this idea of synchronizing with someone. The idea is that you're going to try to match up with their tone of voice, their mannerisms to the extent that you can, their posture, you know, I know it sounds a little creepy at first, but uh, if you're doing it subtly and you're doing it with, with the actually the intention of building rapport and not just creepily mirroring what they're doing, then ultimately it really will work. At the end of the day, I mean, the real purpose of it is to just sort of communicate that, hey, we're on the same wavelength. So we talked about the first way of creating more of a fundamental connection with a person to help sort of expedite rapport. The second trick to making small talk work for you is to think about small talk a little bit differently to think about it as a way to find common ground. And if you can be patient with small talk for just a little bit so that you actually do find that common ground, once you do, it can be really rewarding. You know, pretty quickly, if you're both sort of playing the game and, you know, talking small talk, uh, but knowing that you're gonna get to something deeper, you might just find that one thing that, that you're both passionate about. And all of a sudden it's no longer small talk. You're like, oh, you like snowboarding as well? I just went, and where do you go? And the conversation just takes off. So when you're with someone, you don't want to just sort of ask them random questions. You want to try to um, particularly stay away from uh, closed-ended questions that are just going to give them give you a yes or a no. Like, hey, did you go to the movies? Yes. Or, you know, are you from Idaho? Yes. And 
the conversation just ends there. What you want to do is have open-ended questions that really elicit a response, like, what do you think about such and such? Or, you know, tell me about where you're from. And that's something that's going to actually lead to a deeper conversation. So you might be wondering, well, how do I even start a conversation, especially if, you know, it's somebody that um, I've never talked to before. And there's a very simple formula that you can use, and it actually works really well once you're in the conversation as well. And it's the idea of alternating between a statement and an open-ended question. And an easy way to do it is to make a comment about the, the location around you that you both share. So say you're, you go to um, some sort of event and you're, you walk up next to this person and you say, gosh, you know, the, the ballroom really is beautiful. I'm amazed at how heavy those chandeliers must be. Um, and then you transition quickly to an open-ended question. How do you know uh, the Johnsons? And from there, what you've done is you've you know, sort of disarmed them a little bit. You've broken the ice by offering up a comment that they can react to. And you've followed it up with a nice open-ended question that is hopefully going to lead to them explaining uh, how they know the Johnsons. You can talk about how you know the Johnsons. And then pretty soon, hopefully, the conversation will continue from there. But this, this rhythm can actually work really well once you've gotten into the conversation. Because a lot of the people who don't do as well with conversation and small talk um, have heard, oh, well, I need to ask questions. And so all they do is fire off question after question after question. And if you're on the receiving end of that, sometimes it can feel a little bit like you're in an interrogation and you don't, you don't want that. So what you can do is kind of make a statement, follow it up with an open-ended question, and sometimes that statement can be um, where you're offering up information because ultimately, as you start to build rapport, that's what you're doing is that you're offering a little more information about yourself. They're offering a little more information about th themselves. And soon you start to build rapport and you find that common ground. One of the biggest mistakes people make with small talk, and this is really what gives small talk a, you know, a bad rap, is when people kind of do the small talk on autopilot thing. And this especially happens with say like coworkers and when you see each other maybe like after the weekend you're like hey bill how's your weekend good yours fine how's the family good yours and it's just sort of like this surface level thing that where there's no intention of ever kind of making it go deeper and making it into a more interesting conversation so again you're always looking for ways to kind of go a level deeper with your conversation so even if maybe that your partner in the conversation isn't doesn't have that agenda or doesn't isn't thinking that way, there are ways for you to do that as well. Um, and one of the ways is to not only ask open-ended questions, but to open your response a little bit by giving a little bit more detail and more richness with your response. So in the example we talked about just a second ago with two coworkers who were going to do the autopilot small talk, a guy named Marvin Brown in his book, um, How to Talk to Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere, gives sort of an alternate take on how that conversation could go. So the coworker says, how was your weekend? It was amazing. You know, we took the kids to this like amusement park and we rode all the rides. And, you know, I hadn't been to an amusement park like that in years. The kids had a great time, but I think I may have had more fun. We had cotton candy. We rode all the rides. So by offering up all these rich details, you're actually helping to expand the conversation because you're taking it past that small talk autopilot and giving some you know, meat to the conversation for lack of a better word. So when you're trying to take the conversation deeper, one of the big things you don't want to miss out on is what Nicholas Boothman calls free information. And these are little nuggets that someone throws out that if you seize a hold of them and then follow it up on them would help lead to a deeper conversation. So in his book, uh, Boothman talks about a story of a young man who's on the train and he sees a woman that he wants to go talk to. And he's not hitting on her necessarily, but he just wants to chat her up and be nice. So he goes and sits next to her and he says, oh, hey, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen you here on the train before. And she said, yes, uh, you know, I'm new. Uh, this is my first time. I'm starting a new job at an ad agency in town. And in response, he says, oh, yeah, you know, it, it, it's tough to get a seat on the train sometimes at this hour, but, you know, fortunately you did. And then the conversation sort of peters away. But did you see the free information that he passed on that he didn't he didn't realize was an opportunity? She offered up information that he could have easily followed up on. The fact that she was starting a new job in town at an ad agency, she offered up that free information that he easily could have seized and asked a nice open-ended follow-up question, which would have led to 
you know, a further conversation. Oh, uh, you know, how long have you worked in the, you know, the ad agency field or, wow, uh, do, you know, where are you from? Uh, are you new in town? So there's lots of ways that he could have continued the conversation rather than keeping it on the focus of just the train car itself. She was offering free information about herself that he could have taken to the next level. So Marvin Brown talks about it in a slightly different way. You know, he says, you can kind of think of people like a novel. And with most books, you know, you have a, a table of contents that you can kind of skim and understand, understand what they're all about or what the major components are. But similarly to the free information idea, there are sort of these hidden tables of contents that, you know, if someone reveals it, it can give you a better idea of what makes them tick inside. And these are the things that if we listen carefully, we can, you know, we can suss out and follow up on. And this is why in professional situations, sometimes it's actually better to try to relate to someone on a personal level rather than just talking about business. John Corcoran, who runs a website called Smart Business Revolution, talks about how sometimes this is the best approach at a networking event, not, you know, to go in and not talk about your business or their business, but to try to connect with them on a human level, you know, ask them about their family, ask them about uh, their, you know, vacations and uh, things they like to do for fun and that sort of thing. Because ultimately, especially if you're in a position where they might think that you're trying to leverage that conversation to, uh, you know, improve your situation professionally, they're going to be a lot more open to connecting with you if you try to connect with them, like I said, on a human level. And I've actually seen this in my own life uh, where in my first job, I uh, at one point found myself at an event cornered by um, a really senior level client of ours. And I was so scared because I was terrible at small talk and I, I was terrified that he would want to talk about business or work and that I would reveal myself as not really knowing what I was doing because it was my first job. I didn't have that much experience. But being the seasoned conversationalist that he was, you know, he, he gave me a break. He said, hey, listen, um, what do you like to do for fun? And so we ended up talking about music and hiking and all these, you know, cooking and all these other things that some of them ended up being really common interests between the two of us. And pretty soon, I think we both forgot that, that we had started out as, you know, having small talk. So remember, nobody likes small talk for small talk's sake. It really is a means to an end. And ultimately, it is worthwhile to create deeper conversations and ultimately build rapport with people. It still is frustrating and scary for some people uh, to try to make small talk if you feel not, like you're not good at it. But the more you practice and if you can incorporate some of these techniques we just talked about, the more comfortable you'll be. So how about this weather we're having, huh?